So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Tatiana Bubba, uh, who is giving the seminar today. So she, she's, she's been a co-worker of, of mine, but she uh, obtained her PhD in Italy, in, uh, in Ferrara. And then she moved to Helsinki uh, for a postdoc where we met. And then uh, she was awarded a fellowship in, uh, in Finland and then also uh, <laughs> a fellowship in Cambridge in UK. And she is now associate, uh, associate professor in the University of Bath in the UK. And she's going to, to speak about uh, this project about learning a microlocal prior for limited angle tomography that mixes as you will see, machine learning, harmonic analysis, and so on. So the stage is yours. Thank you, Luca, and thank you uh, to all of you for being here. And it's very nice to be in Genoa. I think it's many years I haven't been here, but it's always uh, super, super nice. Um, so uh, as Luca said, the topic of today is uh, um, fairly new uh, preprint. Uh, we worked. It was one of the last work I was doing uh, while still in uh, in Helsinki. Uh, so it's a collaboration with Samuli Silten and Matti Lassas, who were my supervisors in Helsinki. Uh, Siri Rautio is a, a PhD student uh, uh, working there, and Rashmi Marty, which back who back then was uh, a postdoc as well, but now very recently moved to the University of Cambridge. Um, so the starting point, uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, but uh, just to make sure, in case there is uh, someone who is new to tomographic imaging, um, the whole thing is about uh, wanting to reconstruct uh, the X-ray attenuation of a certain object from a certain measurement. So for example, uh, if uh, we want to take a, a pic, um, look inside, take a peek at a, a walnut, um, at one of the layers of the walnut in this case, so imagine that you are only interested in a two-dimensional cross-section, then the formal problem in tomography is that you take measurements in a, uh, in a certain way which I will describe in a moment and you get uh, your data which uh, look like uh, a superposition of sinusoidal curves and it's usually called a sinogram. But then what uh, we are usually interested in is uh, the inverse problem. So imagine you have no clue about uh, uh, what your measurements represent, so you only see the middle image, then what you want to do is find a strategy to reconstruct. So go back from the data to the uh, to the image reconstruction and finally unveil what's, uh, what, what was hidden in the data. And um, usually you have some information about the physical quantity and uh, the, the modeling of the problem. You're given some noisy measurements and uh, you recover the physical quantity. quantity. Yeah. Yes, I think this is like uh, the very first, uh, uh, very first um, data they acquired. So it's not the custom built micro CT that uh, we informally use nowadays. It's the one downstairs in the lab for those who came. So with the physicist. So it's a, uh, it's not custom built. It's a proper CT scan. So you, you can do also uh, more advanced measurements than the one we, we can do nowadays. So it's a bigger machine. But yes, so. And um, OK, so. Um, how do mathematicians understand the tomography? Well, first, how it works. We, in the most classical uh, geometry, so the, the first one, uh, which, um, which was a, a prototype in the late 70s, uh, there used to be like an, um, an array of X-ray sources, so many array sources uh, aligned. And then on the other side of the object, which here is the gray blob, uh, we have a detector. And the detector is divided into cells. The X-ray source shoots X-rays, uh, which are attenuated in different ways, depending from uh, the different uh, composition of the uh, matter inside. And then they record how many photons uh, um, made it through the object, so those that are not absorbed. Of course, there are many other, uh, this, is a, this is a physical um, simplification. I mean, there are different energy levels, there is scattering, there, are, there is so much more going on. But in the most simplistic model, this is what happens. So you start from a position and then you rotate uh, 
simultaneously the detector and the full array of X-ray sources. Um, and this, from a mathematical perspective, is modeled through the Radon transform, which you, uh, you, can, you can see the formula there. It depends on two parameters, uh, omega, which is the angle, so the position around the object, and S is the offset. So when you discretize this problem, it's just the uh, position on the detector. Okay, and how to solve uh, this, uh, uh, this problem? So inverting uh, uh, the Radon transform has been known for over a century now. And uh, if you are in the continuous setting, you imagine to have infinitely many measurements and you have no noise and you are in the uh, most possible optimistic uh, situation, then you can use uh, something called filter by projection uh, in, uh, if you want to recover a 2D section. And there are many variants of this algorithm for the three-dimensional extension and different geometries, more advanced one, uh, for example, in fan beam, where you have just one X-ray source and uh, generalization through 3D con beam. However, uh, it's well known that this uh, formula might become unstable uh, when uh, the data is scarcely sampled. So imagine that uh, you don't have as many X-ray sources or you don't have or you have a malfunctioning in your detector, not all the detector cells are active, or that uh, you are limited for some re reason to only a wedge uh, around the object. In all those cases, using filter by projection is, uh, um, is suboptimal, and you will see that uh, it doesn't deliver a very good uh, reconstructions. Um, as I was hinting at the beginning, you can discretize this problem. Uh, this becomes a linear, uh, linear problem where your data, the y, is uh, uh, you can uh, interpret as a vector. Then uh, your linear operator uh, can also be seen as a matrix uh, if it makes uh, easier the intuition. And then you have uh, um, the f vector. So your data, you imagine that is stuck in a vector, and then you have some noise on it. So uh, there are many different ways to build R. And, uh, um, but this is not the topic for today. So you can, you can do it in many different ways and there are different ways of uh, um, discretizing line integrals. And on top of that, uh, you have noise, which usually is, uh, is bounded in the, in the modeling that we do. Uh, and to solve this, besides uh, analytical algorithm as FPP, uh, there is uh, a vast literature in iterative reconstructions, so ART, SART, SIRT, so simultaneous iterative reconstruction inspired by uh, Krylov subspaces uh, techniques, or, uh, which is a bit closer to what we do to, to the, to the topic of today, regularization. So you recast your problem as a minimization problem where you have um, a data fidelity term and a regularizer. Uh, term which incorporates some form of a priori knowledge you might have uh, on the solution and uh, since we know that generally our object in this problem is not emitting you can bound uh, from below the object to be uh, to take only positive values and this is also some form of regularization um, so usually the data discrepancy term is a least square term uh, even though Photon is usually understood as a photon counting uh, statistic, but uh, you can often see that if you take out the data from your scan, since there is a post-processing process, this is a good enough approximation for what we are doing. And the regularization term is that uh, um, the easiest thing is to, is, uh, to plug in some uh, smooth Tikhon regularization, but in the latest years, uh, um, sparsity or compress sensing inspired uh, regularizer have been uh, very popular to in uh, in trying in using to tackle these kind of problems and the L here is uh, a suitable operator and uh, it's uh, a big part of the work I present today um, but um, as my title was uh, was hinting at um, we are not simply interested in uh, uh, generic tomographic problems which uh, uh, nowadays are fairly fairly well understood but there are some um, so many uh, devices which uh, are part of our um, everyday life where the uh, tomography problem has actually uh, only 
part of the data and the rest is missing. Uh, one problem where, uh, on which uh, the group in Helsinki worked a lot be before I joined them was the dental imaging VT device where the geometry is that of the limited angle. Uh, so you see that the, the visible wedge is uh, maybe about 40 degrees and you have only 11, 11 point of views and uh, um, they worked uh, to include uh, some sparsity uh, way of formulating the problem so that uh, instead of having to change the way the machine moves around the patients, they could just update the software to deliver better reconstruction from the same data. Another very common application where you have uh, uh, limited angle data is luggage control. Usually the scan, the, the X-ray source are on the top, your luggage goes through and you don't have measurements all around. And there you have also another number of problems like metal artifacts and, uh, and so on. But the one that inspired the talk today is uh, breast imaging. So the scanner you see there is a, a digital breast tomosynthesis um, machine, which are some form of uh, new mammography device that are able to produce 3D images instead of, uh, of two-dimensional ones. Uh, the mm, visible uh, angles are usually from minus 20 to 20, and since these are, um, are the right to, to, to do the um, screening controls, uh, they have to lower as much as possible the X-ray radiation to avoid that you actually get cancer from doing the screen. So they only take generally 11 to 15 views uh, in this uh, very, already very narrow angle. And the difference between uh, these uh, and the other uh, machines, like mammography, is also that the detector is fixed, usually doesn't move, and only the X-ray source moves like that. So the geometry is slightly different from the one of, for instance, uh, uh, for instance, an helical uh, scan CT. Why is this important? Uh, it's because um, generally uh, in the first uh, DBT devices, the digital breast tomosynthesis, they don't use FBP. They use some different uh, algorithm uh, called uh, add and shift or shift and add. Uh, and the typical reconstruction you get are of this quality. So imagine that that's your phantom and you see that you have, uh, if you take some profiles, uh, you have a clear jump. When you reconstruct, uh, you uh, start to see like these streaking artifacts, which are actually typical of limited angle tomography, but you also see that the artifacts stretch so long that a profile like this one, which was supposed to be nothing, actually sees something. And this is a problem if you imagine that you want to detect, to detect uh, cancer formation inside the breast and the contrast is already quite, uh, quite similar to, the, to, the, to that of the healthy tissue. So, um, Basically, the, mot the motivation comes, uh, comes from this. More in general, if you don't think of uh, DBT, but a more generic limited angle tomography problem, how this is modeled mathematically is that you just limit uh, the visible wedge to uh, a, certain, uh, a certain range, uh, minus phi phi for the rest of this talk. And, uh, from a theoretical perspective, you could uh, see, and there are uh, papers about that, that the uniqueness is in generally preserved, but uh, uh, only if you continue to assume to have infinitely many angles, which in practice you never have. Uh, um, the stability uh, will get worse and worse uh, when the range of the angle is decreased. And uh, what you saw in the slide before were streaking artifacts which start uh, to appear. So if, for instance, now you, we use filter back projection for uh, cross-section of the torso, so upper part of the body, um, you see that once, when you have your full range, um, your reconstruction is uh, fairly good uh, using filter back projection. But uh, once you start uh, to reduce uh, uh, the visible wedge, then uh, some parts are already missing, or at least I, I can't see anything there, and uh, this line starts to appear. And it's clear that if you reduce it even more like uh, in the previous slide, and uh, you get closer, but it's still like a bit larger than the information you would have for DBT, you cannot see uh, much. And probably if you hadn't seen the, the full reconstruction, it would be difficult to actually get uh, what's, what's 
which part of the body is this, which slice you are looking at. Um, there is though, uh, a theoretical explanation of this via uh, macrolocal analysis. Um, and basically, what we know is that uh, part of the wavefront set of the singularity is missing from the data. So um, this gets technical, but uh, what I want to give is just uh, is just the idea. Um, basically, what uh, in a, and the reference set allows you to to have information about not only the location of a singularity, but also the direction of the singularity through is a normal uh, normal vector and. Uh, in the case, so usually you, you are looking for a tuple of a location and the direction in that point. Okay. And uh, in the case of uh, limited data CT, there is uh, a seminal paper by Todd Quinto in 1993 that describes really, really well uh, what happens uh, starting from the, from the data, so from the sinogram, um, from the sinogram domain, in which he, he uh, explained really well uh, which data we can expect uh, to see in the reconstruction and which data are lost forever because they are not there. And there is a bit more recent paper that Todd Quinto did with uh, Jürgen Frickel. Uh, uh, where the characterization is done in the filter back projection domain, and uh, where they also suggest how um, artifacts can be can be re reduced. In practice, uh, what you see is that uh, uh, depending on which one is your visible wedge, uh, the, the part that you call visible is the one that uh, has singularity tangent to sampled lines of the transform, and the rest is uh, invisible. So the singularities that are not tangent to the sample lines cannot, cannot be recovered in any, in any way. Okay, and uh, this is an example with the Shep Logan phantom, and uh, the, the part highlighted there are actually computed uh, using uh, the results in the paper, not just uh, me using uh, you know, a marker or something. Um, and I'll explain you how in a, in a bit. Okay, um, this is the part where actually uh, different families of wavelet shirt come, uh, come, into, come into the game. Um, before we get there, just uh, just a brief uh, just a brief uh, recap uh, in case you mm, never heard of this. Um, wavelet and shearlet uh, can be understood as a fine system. So uh, you take uh, uh, a generator function psi, uh, which depends on a family of parameters. Usually, you can take uh, uh, well. The easiest one is the location parameter t, which basically describes the offset, and then you have uh, uh, a matrix. Uh, for example, uh, which is uh, uh, invertible one. And then you need uh, uh, two key actors, which are the uh, deletion um, operator and the translation operator, okay, defined up there. And with these, uh, you can, for example, have a definition of wavelets in 2D by taking simply the isotropic scaling. So a multiple of the identity we uh, dilate um, according to some para positive parameter A uh, in the same way in two direction. Uh, but you can, of course, uh, generalize to n dimensions, but uh, it's, not, uh, it's not relevant for the rest of this talk. And shearlet, uh, you can still do the same trick, except that you need two different, uh, uh, two different transforms. Um, you need uh, not an isotropic dilation anymore, but you have an anisotropic one. So the scaling is in a way parabolic uh, um, in this sense, so that you stretch differently in different uh, uh, axes. And then uh, you can incorporate some information about uh, um, orientation uh, by using uh, the shear transformation, the tr tr transform. So basically, you have the identity on the diagonal, and then you have this parameter S, which is uh, the slope. Uh, uh, or the tangent uh, to a certain direction theta uh, of uh, rotation, okay? Uh, so that your vertebral matrix looks looks like this, and it's the composition composition of two operators. Once you have these, then you can uh, define the system also in the discrete domain, where discrete here refers to the parameters. So you can sample instead of you can a you can imagine to be two to the power of j and uh, 
S is discretized as an uh, integer parameter K for the shearlets, and then up above there you, you define the discrete wavelet system uh, starting from the uh, generator function Psi, and of course you would need a scaling function to describe the low-pass information, and you do similarly for the, um, for the shearlet case, and you can see here the most general definition. The difference between wavelet and shearlet is that the um, support of shearlets can be stretched as much as you want uh, because of the anisotropic scaling, but then you can also rotate and align it to, this, to better describe the singularity. And it is really by using the continuous theory of wavelet and shearlet that one and combining this with uh, the result from micro local analysis that one can actually uh, gather very precise information about the wavefront set um, and in particular one of the main results and which made the shearlet very popular was that uh, if you have a, a smooth function in a certain point and certain she shearing direction as zero then you can prove that yeah, the coefficient associated with this uh, decay really really fast and uh, uh, the only coefficient which do not decay fast are the ones speaking information about the boundaries so your singularities okay and uh, with wavelets instead, you do have information about the singular support, so the locations, but uh, there is no way you can recover information about uh, the directions uh, of this. And this is the interplay that uh, starts uh, to, to appear between macro-local analysis, uh, uh, harmonic analysis, uh, and, uh, and uh, in the context of the Radon transform. Okay, so basically uh, what this says is that the Schiller transform uh, uh, is able to um, uh, resolve completely the wavefront set, so get full access. Wavelets uh, can only recover the singular support of the function. It was uh, uh, basically using these that uh, um, a couple of years back, uh, we started to, to have a, uh, um, the idea of using the Schillet coefficient to basically uh, complete, so infer in a way, fill in the missing part of the wavefront set. Because if you uh, think back at the picture of the uh, of the Shep Logan Phantom, that one was exactly computed by using Shearlet. So the coloring you see there is what the Shearlet transform sees after applying the Radon transform. So you see that you have some parts of the wavefront set and others are not there, but you also know the Shearlet are proven to resolve the wavefront set. So maybe there is a way to connect the different branches and uh, uh, and fill in what the information that is missing there. So the idea was, uh, okay, since uh, L1 reconstruction can give us pretty much state-of-the-art reconstruction, at least um, uh, at least when we were working on this initially, so um, four or five years ago, then we first reconstruct by using uh, NL1 minimization and we get the best we can out of our data. Then we basically split the coefficient into a visible and invisible part. Um, here, Shirley Kubin just, just says, imagine the coefficient stacked uh, one on top of the other, uh, instead of seeing them projected on the same plane. And once we have the visible one, which we know uh, has to be a perfect information because of the uh, theory developed uh, by Quinto and, uh, and Frickel, uh, then we will have some part which is invisible, so there's nothing there. And the idea was to use deep learning uh, to impaint uh, the coefficient so that then we could go back and have an impainted reconstruction. So find a uh, structure for the uh, um, learning uh, that uh, could somehow enforce continuity in the wavefront set. So this was basically the idea behind uh, learning the invisible, and uh, that's, uh, that's pretty much how it ended up being. So we, we use uh, um, a sparsity formulation, uh, analysis sparsity formulation associated with the Shearlet transform. We compute the best, uh, the best we can uh, a reconstruction. We will have some part missing, but then once we take the Shearlet coefficient, the visible ones are basically super reliable thanks to the theory, and the invisible one will really be zero or numerically zero since you're dealing with a, a numerical setting and then what we did is that we we used the UNET to do supervised learning of invisible coefficients so we were feeding in the whole stack of coefficient using a UNET to uh, extrapolate the invisible ones combining these uh, by project uh, or yeah uh, to the to the um, 
image domain and have our reconstruction. Okay. And um, this was pretty much uh, the first idea uh, we had in this sense of combining uh, uh, a model-based approach with a data-driven one, uh, where we limited uh, the approach of uh, deep learning to one part which we, can, we couldn't really solve uh, in, a, in a different way through model-based uh, approaches. So, this approach had some, some, some pros, so um, we didn't need to process the entire image. We had a better performance because we spent so much time in, a perfect, uh, in having a very good input that we didn't, do, didn't need to do extra denoising or suppression of artifacts. And uh, it, was, uh, it, it enforced automatically consistency in the data, and it was open for better generalization. But as I said at the uh, year, the, the, the fact that we spent so much time in having a better input meant that actually preparing the input, so solving the L1 minimization problem um, for 2,000 images, that took forever, basically, over a day. And it was mostly dominated by the fact that to have a very good reconstruction, uh, the Schiller transform is quite uh, time consuming because of the redundancy and uh, how large it is. So if you compare, uh, you have two main operators, the Radon transform and the Schiller transform. The Schiller transform is way more time consuming than the Radon one. And uh, the other thing was that uh, you really needed to tune uh, the weights uh, in front of the Schiller coefficient uh, to beat our method, like total variation, for example, and this uh, was uh, was really uh, taking up a time in the in the whole pipeline. So we asked ourselves, uh, can we do something about it? And actually, one time I was presenting this this paper a while back, uh, someone said, uh, uh, how about you consider using something different uh, from Shirlet, which still has some information about directionality, even though you might lose uh, some uh, uh, theoretical guarantees, uh, which uh, with uh, with Shirlet are very consolidated. So, um, this is where it comes from. Um, let's take a, a look back at the frequency tilings of, each, of these two transforms. So, the, here you see how uh, the tiling is in the wavelet domain for uh, in the 2D, two-dimensional domain. The, the, the letters you see there, H stands for high-pass filter, L for uh, low-pass filter, and these are the filters usually associated with uh, the scaling function and the uh, wavelet function uh, for the um, fast implementation of wavelets uh, in practice. So usually, real-valued real wavelets uh, uh, in 2D are understood to give information about uh, horizontal, vertical details, and some diagonal details at approximately 45 degrees. So of course, they don't have proper uh, diagonal information, but when you look uh, at the decomposition in practice, you could see that some residual information is there, and uh, usually because of uh, how the hard filters are, um, are um, work, those coefficients given by the uh, separable composition of uh, uh, the high-pass filter in both dimensions are called diagonal coefficients. Okay, and the name stands for uh, whatever mother function you, you use. With Shirlet instead, and here you're looking at the Fourier domain, um, the situation is different. Your support becomes trapezoidal. You have as many directions as you wish at different uh, scales. And uh, in practice, uh, this can be as much of a redundant information as you wish, and this can be infinitely elongated, uh, as I showed you when, uh, when we looked at the construction. So the idea was, uh, is there something in between? Like, uh, uh, maybe I don't go there, that I have that many inf directions, which can be very helpful, and it's proven to, to be what you need in theory to prove strong results. But uh, maybe I have some limited uh, uh, directional information, but uh, I, uh, to implement it, uh, it costs me like a real valued wavelet. And pretty much this was the idea behind complex valued wavelets, uh, or one, one particular family of, complex, uh, of the complex wavelet transform. Uh, this is the one called dual tree, and the name comes from the fact that you basically, in 1D, you use real wavelet for the real and imaginary part. Then this interpretation is lost when you go in uh, two dimension and higher, but that's, that's pretty much how it worked in the, at the beginning. And you see that when you look at the frequency tiling of complex-valued wavelet, you have uh, 
limited directional information in practice. So this construction is really done in the discrete and digital setting, not really in the continuous like it's done for Shirlet and real valued billets. And what you can see is that you might have some information at, at plus or minus 15 degrees, plus and minus 45 and plus and minus 75 degrees. And by construction, you basically need only to construct the positive part and the rest uh, is obtained by, by symmetry. So the implementation is actually really fast. And uh, what I mean, what I mean uh, by we have some form of uh, uh, directional information in practice is, uh, is this one. Imagine you have this ball. Uh, this is a visualization in a higher dimension, but probably it's easier. So this ball is growing in time, and we are looking at a certain instant. Uh, when you use real valued wavelet to look at uh, the coefficient and ask, how does this look? look look in the, uh, along, um, in the wavelet domain along a certain axis, so the, the zeta axis or the x3 axis in the drawing, real wavelet seems to give you basically no information. I mean, if you didn't have this ball, I don't think <laughs> it would be very meaningful. But uh, if you plug it in complex wavelet, uh, you start to see uh, a shape resembling already the ball. And you see that this is uh, cur curving a bit, and even though it's not as good as the one that uh, Shirlet gives you, which has many more direction, is still a good enough uh, a good enough approximation so that uh, you could claim that in practice uh, some information is there and can be and can be used to do a similar job to the one that Shirlet did, even though you don't have theoretical guarantees anymore. Um, okay. So uh, the new idea was basically to combine these and to refine a bit uh, the learn the invisible step. So we now uh, construct, uh, we do still the recover the visible step where uh, instead of using the Schirlen transform, we now have the complex wavelet transform. So this, uh, it's way faster to compute, cheaper, uh, and uh, it gives uh, good enough reconstruction. Not as good as Shearlet's because it's not possible to suppress the artifacts completely, but still you have some, uh, some information there. Um, then to do the to learn the coefficients, um, we actually resorted to predict a boundary estimate for the singular support by combining two different neural networks and morphological operations. In particular, we use three kinds of operations. Morphological opening, which uh, uh, cleans the visible coefficient. So imagine you take the transform. Uh, from the numerical perspective, there is always some garbage in there, so some coefficient which pick up noise or uh, um, some information which shouldn't be there. What this does is that it kind of uh, gets rid of the information which shouldn't be there, but maintains the key part, so the information about the boundaries in particular. Then this is fed into a first neural network which transforms this visible coefficient into a binary map, and these are then uh, used um, as an initial guess for the singular support, but after di dilation. I will show you how this is done later, uh, but there is a way to kind of enforce uh, uh, an initial guess by using dilation and some specific structural element uh, which we custom made for, the, um, for this uh, project. And then at the end, once you have an estimate for the singular support, you use the morphological skeleton, which extracts the boundaries. So it uh, maintains the same topological shape, but reduce the support to a one pixel, one pixel curve uh, and extract the boundary. And once we have this estimate, uh, rather than incorporating into the reconstruction, we just superimpose to the initial reconstruction to have uh, a uh, boundary estimate of uh, what uh, it should be the uh, the real uh, wavefront set, uh, basically. Okay, and this is pretty much uh, the workflow. We start with a very limited angle sinogram. We we use uh, uh, a primal dual fixing point algorithm to solve the problem, or but you can take. Uh, Shumble Park or any other primal dual algorithm, we get a reconstruction. As you see, noise is pretty much suppressed, but the streaking artifacts are still there. So once uh, 
uh, we go to the next step and we compute uh, complex wavelet dual tree transform, we get the coefficient, and there you see the, um, the absolute value of the coefficient, and you see that in two of the subbands we have some information, which is a bit noisy, and in the others we have some numerical rubbish, uh, even though it should be all zero pretty much or we would expect to be pretty much zero so the next step is that we use a morphological opening with those elements to basically pick up the main uh, main direction so those are lines along the 15 degrees uh, uh, plus and minus 15 degrees angles and uh, and once we add this uh, binary uh, inform uh, sorry once we have these uh, uh, cleaned uh, subbands and uh, the rest of the subbands are zero. We use this as an input for the neural network to learn uh, a binary a binary mask uh, for the visible part uh, of the coefficients. Okay, and how this is done is pretty standard unit where uh, um, it's an autoencoder and we use uh, uh, basically ReLUs as activation function except at the last layer where we use a sigmoid because we want a binary output and there is much normalization done uh, after each step and we concatenate uh, the encoder and the decoder part. So if we input uh, the opened the morphological open version of the coefficient and what we get is an output of the a binary mask which tells you pretty much in this band which we have some information which comes reliably from the analysis that's how the mask for the singular support should look like once we have these we go back as to uh, applying morphological dilation so so here you need to define some uh, custom made structural element these are the ones we, we designed specifically for, for the application. And what you do is that starting from the visible part, we dilate once and we dilate twice with the different morphological operation. And this serves as the input for the second neural network, whose job is basically to, to predict uh, the parts that are missing. So these are just passed as an information which is given, and these are predicted by, by the network. Okay. Once we have these, then we have pretty much the, the R part of the job is done. You combine these, you get the singular support. Maybe, yes, the second, uh, also the second network is very similar to the other one, except that there is no batch normalization, but the remaining of the structure stays the same. And, uh, Yes, so once we have an estimate, we can have the full singular support. We apply the skeleton morphological operator, which kind of thins out uh, the boundary, and this is used to, to superimpose it to the original reconstruction, and we get uh, our final information. So it's the original reconstruction, and this is the extent of the boundary. Okay, so how does this work in practice? Um, so for both uh, neural networks, we trained on uh, 5,000 uh, um, synthetic images of two-dimensional ellipses, uh, of which uh, 500 were kept for validation. Um, the size is 128 times 128, and then it was the classical film, different radius, tilt positions in the different images. images. And we had a visible wedge of 40 degrees, uh, which is the one that uh, you usually uh, digital breast homosynthesis has, but we had a dense, very dense uh, projection. So 50 projection, it means uh, uh, even in space, but it means less than a degree from each other. And uh, to make it easier, we use the parallel beam geometry instead of fan beam. And uh, in the testing uh, side, instead, instead of having many different uh, uh, to these images, we had a three-dimensional uh, phantom um, consisting of three different LP balls so with P equal to 1.5, uh, and these uh, in the custom background, and this was used as a different, uh, uh, separately as different uh, two-dimensional sections. But bear in mind that uh, since the way the digital breast uh, tomosynthesis works is that uh, you basically put your breast on the on the detector, you look at slices in this direction. So 
so it's the x z uh, plane um, so what you do is that you predict your boundary estimate in the x z plane and then you look at slicing in the x y plane so this is a bit different from what tomography has done and the geometry is basically matching the one of the two dimensional setting just because we treat slicely slices independently so as 2d problems and then we uh, stacked everything together Okay, and this is how the results look like. So these are, uh, you're looking at the X, Z plane. So what a doctor would look like if uh, they, uh, they would be, this would come from a DBT application. And you see uh, different uh, uh, Y levels uh, uh, of this uh, LP ball. Uh, these are the reconstruction that you get with uh, the tomosynthesis reconstruction. So you see they, they are, as, uh, as you expect, just uh, some very faded away uh, and stretched out uh, reconstructions. If uh, we stop at the first, uh, uh, and our method is that superimpose the L1 reconstruction plus uh, the boundaries estimate coming from the different networks. And you see that if you superimpose there, you recover pretty much the information that you know should be there. So maybe this is not so, so impressive. What is impressive is if you look at this in the XY plane, so what you see is that in particular, we didn't have any information in the first and in the last slices. But if you wouldn't have any boundary estimate and would look only at the tomosynthesis reconstruction, you would see something in the last two cases. And you might think that there is something there. Instead, the boundary estimator basically tells you you only have information here. And so you can conclude that those in the first and in the last column, it was just artifacts that shouldn't be there, so phantom uh, ghosts coming from the other slices uh, in there. Okay, so uh, basically this is kind of uh, um, another example how it's possible to uh, have a tight interplay between different uh, areas of mathematics. We combine um, regularization theory of inverse problems, harmonic analysis, microlocal analysis, some morphological operations, and machine learning to, to kind of guess a microlocal prior for uh, limited angle reconstructions. Um, there is a lot that can still be done. Uh, in particular, this was part of a project uh, in collaboration with the doctors where uh, they wanted to, to be able to distinguish um, benign from malignant tumors and where the the differences in the shape. So the good ones have very smooth boundaries. The malignant ones are very, uh, very uh, spiky. So if one can have uh, a microlocal power that can overlap on top of the reconstruction, this could be a valuable option and one that uh, uh, would be considered a faithful approach and uh, would allow them to, to be used to classify tumors uh, without looking at the reconstruction anymore. Um, uh, at the moment, we are working on uh, on testing the approach with uh, uh, real data uh, and uh, extending it to fanbin combined geometries, which is actually the straightforward part. And then uh, one could think also to use the microlocal pyre. So once you have a boundary estimate in the in solving the uh, inverse problem, so maybe uh, if you if one finds a way to incorporate it in the L1 minimization problem, then one can get rid of uh, one of the two networks. And uh, I'm happy to, to answer any questions you might have. So thank you very much, Tatiana, for, <laughs> for the talk. Very clear. You're in perfect time. So we have time for a few questions from the audience or curiosities. Oh, sorry, I, I, I was not, uh, I mean, I didn't know this uh, recent work, but so I I'm mm -hmm. just uh, want to understand better. Um, so you use deep learning to basically learn the full wave from set somehow. You, are, mm -hmm. you have some partial information and you're recovering the, yes. the whole singularities. I mean, but then compared to the earlier work in learning invisible, it seems that there is some, maybe a missing thing that, I mean, I mean, because now you are basically superimposing this boundary mm -hmm. on the on the on what you were getting in the top. Yes. But I I, I wonder if you can I don't know do something more. I yeah, I mean, I think that was the last point of uh, of the last slide. That okay. uh, once you have uh, 
actually V is, or is there a way that uh, if you have already the binary mask from that one, I mean, if you can incorporate it into the L1 regularization problem instead of just superimposing it. So uh, use it to, instead of overlapping, actually getting a good image in the end. So that's the idea. And, uh, we still haven't figured it out because uh, this is a mask, so actually it's a very um, hard prior in a, in a sense, right? So you could uh, use it to, to say, uh, while you're reconstructing, okay, I cut according to these sharp boundaries, uh, but uh, that didn't work so far, so we need a smarter idea to do it, for example. Uh, so I don't, I don't have an answer, but yes, that would be, that'd be good if you have ideas. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Now another curiosity, just, uh, but here, when you're doing this reconstruction, maybe are you somehow imposing some smoothness on this um, boundary, or or you can recover um, also very in a, um, no, not not really. So how you can improve um, induce the smoothness is when you design these structural elements. So those are not coming from some. I don't know, uh, library that MATLAB or Python has. We, we designed it ourselves by looking at how the coefficient behave. So if you change these and you make them different, uh, you enforce different properties. So because once you start from that and you dilate, uh, if you have different structural element, the result is different. So if you make them smoother, different sizes, different properties, the output changes a lot. So we had to work on that. This was the one we designed thinking of uh, uh, the information we have, so this kind of mimic the plus minus uh, 15, 45, and 75 degrees uh, information of the complex valued wavelet, but uh, yeah, could okay. be done differently. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I actually have a curiosity on, mm -hmm. uh, on this same topic. So this kind of morphological, uh, I don't know if they are filters, those, those images yeah, yeah. giving the morphological mm -hmm. transformation. So would it be meaningful to also learn them or correct them by learning just to incorporate maybe something different than what yeah, you expect? Yeah, I mean, definitely, I think it could be done, but, uh, but yeah. Yeah, it could be, I mean, it could be done because then you don't force them to be as you think uh, they should be, but uh, you could learn it from the transform, for example, because it really comes from that. I see. Yeah, could be done. Thank you. So thank you, very nice talk. Uh, so I have two questions. One is uh, related to, to, to all uh, this stuff, which, which is related to the, also to the fact that maybe you can recover rough uh, edges, but in particular, can you recover also just non-convex uh, stuff? So in the sense, so this is highly local, yeah. so you can recover also yeah, non-convex I mean or... I didn't show it here, but yes, we tried to like star-shaped uh, star-shaped thingies. So really, okay. imagine a, a star. It still worked. Uh, maybe it needed to be. It could be improved uh, a bit more, but uh, it was reliable to then do classification on that. So that's what what we were doing. Okay. Yeah. And then the other thing. So I, I didn't uh, uh, catch the part where. So you said that this is uh, like X Z, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But then for this, you do this for every y, and then you reconstruct the x, y, right? Exactly. So we, we do this for every y, and then we stack everything together, and then we look at uh, x, y. OK. Yeah. So, uh, so in this way, you, you are not uh, talking between the layers, right? So the y layers, yeah. uh, they do not interact. But Exactly. It should be. It should be done, yes. But that that's also in the working that okay, you could okay, use okay. just combeam transform to generate, for example, the oh okay uh, the the 3D data. Okay. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Okay. So it can be done. It, you just need to connect them with the right uh, uh, CT uh, model. Okay. 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 Thank you. Ah. Any other question? Or if you have any. Additional curiosity, you know, Tatiana will be here also for the coffee and later on, so feel free to discuss. So by now, I think we thank Tatiana again for the great talk. Thank you.